Welcome to Radio Free South Africa. This is your host, Karen Smith. Tonight, I'm very privileged and honored to have as my guest, Nick Griffin. Nick was the leader of the British Nationalist Party, and he is now the Vice President of the Alliance for Peace and Freedom in Europe. Nick is very much on the side of the white South Africans because he is against oppression of any race, anywhere, and he has seen the results of black Africans flooding into white countries, especially his own country of the UK. He has spoken out on many occasions against the, the saturation of white countries with black people who do not belong there, do not want to integrate, and do not want to become useful citizens in those countries. What they seem to want to do is to turn European countries into what they are apparently fleeing from in Africa. Welcome, Nick. Thank you very much. It is very great to have you here, Nick. Nick, many, many words have been written about you, hundreds of thousands of words. I have spent the last 10 days reading about Nick Griffin. Um, a lot of people don't like you, and yet other people very much do like you. But I don't think that we need to go into very much of that here, except for you to please tell my American audience and international audience who you really are, because you may be known in Britain and you may be known in circles in Europe, but the general man in the street in other countries doesn't really know who sure. you are and what you stand for. So if you'd just tell us a little about yourself. Indeed, because um, thanks for that. The, the the first thing to note is that if you look on the, the internet, and for instance at Wikipedia, uh, the entry on me is horrifically inaccurate, but they won't even let me edit it to put it right. So uh, what people get if they just look on the internet is... Uh, you know, there is a huge amount of bias there. It's not just me. It's anyone is involved in a, a nationalistic, uh, patriotic uh, you know, activity uh, on behalf of any of the European nations of the world is going to get it in the neck. So as long as people understand that and what they may have seen or read isn't me, then, then we're, we're halfway there. So um, I was born in 1959 into a sort of a fairly fairly standard middle class family in London, except for the fact that my parents met at a Communist Party meeting, but they'd gone with two different groups of young conservatives to, to heckle and call the problems at. Uh, so uh, that gives you an idea of the fact I grew up in a very political family. Um, I was involved as a, a young conservative very early on. Then in 19, when I was 15, I went to a meeting of the, the National Front in Britain, which in those days was uh, nothing like the, uh, the gang of really substandard skinheads that it became many, many years later. Mm. Uh, it was a, a decent organisation of British people who were looking at what was happening to our country. Even in the 70s, it was certain parts of London and Birmingham, other major cities, were being very rapidly affected by mass immigration from the third world. Uh, and Enoch Powell, the great British politician in 1968, had said that by the year 2000, the population would be 5% non-white, and after that, it would um, uh, deteriorate very rapidly. And he warned that this would, like watching a nation, heap up its own funeral pyre. And I was very taken with that and understood it. So when I was 15, I joined the National Front in 1974. Uh, I was an activist and then uh, a leading member of the Front till 89, when I party company with it. Um, then I got involved with the British National Party, which was a sort of successor to it in, in um, 1990. Three or four, I became was elected to lead it in 1999, uh, and turned it from being really a political joke into something that, in the elections of 2008, we took 14 percent of the vote across the whole country in local elections. If we hadn't had a first past the post system, if we'd had a, an electoral system like they have in most of the rest of Europe, uh, we would have had probably a thousand councillors elected. Would have been an enormous breakthrough. Um, as it was, we frightened the living daylights out of them. Went on, I became, as, I said, as we said in the introduction, a um, member of the European Parliament in um, 2009. Served there for five years. Uh, I'm family man. I've got four grown-up children, uh, four grandchildren and another one on the way in a couple of days' time. Uh, and I've always been basically bloody-minded and uh, <laughs> refused to be told what I should and shouldn't think by other people. 
Uh, I've always been like that, and uh, I intend to stay that way. Well, I think you have to be bloody-minded, um, Nick, in order to stand up for anything. Because uh, my husband has a saying, stand up and be counted or lie down and be mounted. And literally, <laughs> if you are not bloody-minded, you are going to lie down and be driven <laughs> over. So the, 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 the patriotism in us is the bloody-mindedness in us, is it not? I think so, yes, yep. You know, um, and you said something about, um, and you mentioned nationalism. You just mentioned nationalism worldwide right now, and it's almost the same as holding a red rag to a bull. Um, you're not allowed to be patriotic. You are not allowed to love your own right, race if you're white. It's okay yes. to be a nationalist if you're any other race. Yes, absolutely so. Yeah, we, I mean, these things haven't, by, haven't happened by accident. Uh, one, one of the reasons that I uh, became committed to the uh, the cause of whites in South Africa and especially the Boers was an understanding that uh, what happens to them today happens to us tomorrow because this is part of an overall plan by various vested interest groups uh, to whom uh, the, the peoples of Europe are, are distasteful and a problem. I, I do have another friend uh, that you have in, been on his show before, Ken Giverdon. Ken says that the white race are the only people standing uh, in the way of the new world order because we are creative, we are bloody-minded, we do think for ourselves, and we are a big problem in creating the new world order because we will not lie down and be quiet. Yes, indeed. Uh, certainly one of the uh, the key figures is there's different strands of this. I don't think it's, it's not one, uh, one sinister organisation. It's whole groups of sinister organisations and vested interests. One of the ones that I've, I suppose, been closest to in the European Parliament was the, the whole idea of a, a federal European superstate was created by a man called Richard kudinov uh who was a, a very, very mixed up, mixed race uh, aristocrat at the turn of the last century, uh, and he really was the intellectual godfather of this European Union monstrosity. Uh, and he wrote, and it was very clearly understood, it's always been understood, that he wrote and favoured creating a, a European superstate, which involved, first of all, destroying the nation states, the mm -hmm. traditional states, mm -hmm. and that had to be done undemocratically because ordinary Frenchmen and women are. Uh, are loyal to France, and ordinary Germans love Germany, and ordinary English people love England, and so on. So it had to be done in, undemocratically, and it was always going to be unstable, because they could create the United States of Europe uh, by crushing down the uh, the slave states. Uh, but while uh, the, the peoples of the nations that had created those old states were still there, there'd always be a chance one day they would revolt and take their freedom back. So he wrote as a second part of his book, Practical Idealism, in 1926, uh, he wrote that as well as uh, destroying the institutions of the nation-state, it was essential to destroy the, the peoples who gave rise to the nation-state. So he created this uh, and promoted this idea of mass immigration and uh, socially engineered integration in order to create a, a, a mixed race. He called it the, a, a, neg a negroid Eurasian cross. Uh, and these people, once that was done to us, uh, would be serfs for all time for a, a self-selected elite. Uh, and that's you know, that's not fantasy. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's in the book written by the man who basically created the European Union. And European politicians to this day vie to be awarded the kudinov Gelergi Prize, which is issued every two years. One of the recent recipients for this prize for people who have done the most to integrate Europe, i.e. destroy the nations of Europe, was no less than Angela Merkel. And we can see her busily destroying Germany at this minute. Absolutely. And she doesn't care how many people stand up against her either. She just seems impervious to and immune from any blowback from what Indeed. she's doing. Yes, yep. they're completely totalitarian, these people. It's a sort of godless religion that they have. Uh, and when any, any person who has some kind of religious fervor, um, you know, they get carried away with it, and anyone who stands in their way, they're not just wrong, they're a heretic, and they have to be crushed. And that is why we have all these new terms, Islamophobia, racism, um, all of those terms, because they are, they, they are 
working <laughs> to crush opposition because you don't want to be called that, so you just step back and keep quiet. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's, racism is a classic example. It was actually created as a term by Leon Trotsky, uh, who was one of the bloodiest mass murderers of history. Uh, and it's used, nevertheless, as a sort of moral club uh, to try to beat us down, those of us uh, who want to preserve, in fact, not only our own people, but all the peoples of the world. You know, when, they, when they talk about diversity, I think a diverse world is a really good thing. It's an interesting thing. And peoples and cultures and places should be different. Uh, and their vision of you know one sort of monochrome, grey, grey brownie world with one one corporate culture where we all drink the same Coca Cola, eat the same McDonald's, look the same, and do the same, and obediently pay our taxes. Uh, I think that's a horrible vision of a world. Terrible. So there are two things that I thought about when you in your first opening statements. There, one was the European Union. Now they're trying, having seen the failure of that. Now the African Union is being formed, and under Obama, the American Union is also being formed. Now, have they not seen the failure of the European Union and what it leads to? But then again, you said that was the plan from the very beginning, was to destroy borders and nation states, etc. So even though that from a, a, a person, an ordinary person's point of view, it's a failure. From the point of view of the elite, it was an absolute success. Indeed, in, in, exactly so. Yes, you, you have to judge, you know, what do you mean by failure or success? Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, peaceful relations between different nations w wasn't what they were after in the first place. So it's working quite well. Uh, the, the peasants, unfortunately, are, you know, somewhat revolting, but they'll, uh, they have to put up with that. And the, the whole, you put your finger on it in a way by talking about these other regional blocks. Because the, from the very beginning, the, uh, the New World Order idea was that it would start off with the creation of regional blocks, and then these would gradually be brought together. Uh, and any, any Western politician, whether it's Cameron, Merkel or Obama, they're, in the end, they're virtually all of them in the pocket, either directly or indirectly, of the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers. The whole thing really is a, effectively a... Uh, a giant scam operated by the uh, the Rockefeller and the Rothschild clans to um, make sure that uh, the the global rule of the banks doesn't just happen by default through money, but is actually enforced through state power as well. You know, because we've been everybody's talking about this being so 1984 and Orwellian. I have recently reread 1984 just just for interest sake. Mm -hmm. And it is so scary how absolutely apt it is. Because the, the part where they say that war has to be constant, it's not to win the war. And it, it, it's simply to, to drive consumerism. So the excess, the excess products are used by the war efforts, and there's never enough for the people. It, it, it is so apt in what is yes. happening today. It's it's actually frightening if you reread that book because it, it is it, yeah it, yeah. It, it is remarkably apt it really is the more remarkable actually because Orwell coming from a conventional socialist background I don't think had any grasp understanding of the the fiat money banking swindle whereby all the money in the world effectively is created as an interest bearing debt mm. so the economy has to keep on growing uh, otherwise it all grinds to a halt. Uh, and yet the people can't afford to buy what the economy can produce. So every now and again, they had to have a, a huge war, not just to keep us busy and amused and, and bloodlet, uh, but also to, to use up this so-called surplus consumption, which in a world where kids go hungry to sleep at night is is really an obscene concept. It, it totally is. I, I, I'm, I'm horrified. And talking about kids going hungry to sleep at night, we now go to, go to South Africa. Um, I'm kind of diverting a little here but we recently estimated that there are a million white South Africans out of an estimated population of 3.5 million and an estimated third of that number is living in abject poverty and of mm -hmm. that we estimate that 350,000 are children now we are taking away from those children any future what so ever. But in this particular um, scenario, 
they're not even state funded. So I, I, I don't, I just don't understand, apart from the annihilation of the white race, that's the only thing that I can see here. I don't see that we are going to have to be dependent on the state for, for our futures, our welfare and everything so that we will do whatever they say in order to keep the, the, the funds and the, the food coming. In this particular case, they don't want them dependent on the state because the state is not helping them, but they are starving. Yes, it's a, a very, very grim outlook. I mean, basically, to depend on any state is dangerous because it is true that all power corrupts, uh, and that's true even of a good state. But uh, when you're depending on a state which is uh, in the hands of people who, for all sorts of reasons, are fundamentally and inherently hostile to your very existence, uh, it's really a very, very dangerous posi position to be in. Uh, so I think that the uh, the... Uh, the liberal English, of course, I think, have mainly been able to get out because they had, uh, you know, grandparents in Britain uh -huh. and so on, so they had those passports. It's good for them. Uh, the very rich have all got out because they're able to get out, leaving you know middle class and working class Afrikaners in particular with historically nowhere else to go. Europe having turned their back on them because, of course, they are white and therefore innately second class or lower than that forms of life as far as our political and media elite are concerned. Uh, and there they are, stuck in a stuck in a country where the government is brutally hostile to them. I think they only have two choices. One is to seek geographical separation within parts of South Africa, as I know is being done in several experiments, um, or to find ways to leave um, and to get somewhere where they'll, they and their children will be appreciated for what they are, which is intelligent, hard-working, good citizens, and be able uh, to practice their own culture, their own identity, speak their own language, and so on. Um, but it's that's not something clearly that's going to happen in any part of the world controlled by uh, people like the ANC or people like the, the the more subtle monsters who now control Western Europe or North America. It, it's a very frightening situation um, because this year... Things have, have really heated up for the whites in South Africa. The murders are happening now. Well, this year so far, it's, a, it's an average of two, two white torture murders a day. The mm -hmm. farm attacks, you know, the survivors, the people who are yes. actually killed, have escalated to, a, to an extent where it, it, it is absolutely horrifically frightening. And nobody, nobody, still today, nobody's talking about it. No, indeed, indeed. Uh, I, I raised the point in the, I remember, in the European Parliament on several occasions. I uh, had um, Henk van Graaf mm. uh, came, came over from the Transvaal Farmers Union uh, and we held a, a press conference there with several other, uh, one of the Flemish uh, MEPs who was very good on the issue as well. Uh, but basically when we were talking about this, uh, the, the attitude of the entire liberal elite at that place, which includes people who call themselves conservatives and Christian Democrats, uh, was just a, a weary contempt. Uh, and they, uh, they're well aware of what's going on, but they simply don't give a damn because, as I said before, white people just don't count in their heads. Uh, we're all touched with some kind of original sin. Uh, and it's pol they know it's politically dangerous to express any kind of sympathy with any white victim because um, the, uh, the liberal left and the global elitists will turn around and say, well, what's this? Do I smell some kind of Nazism? Why are you interested in the white race? And the, um, there's, there's politicians who perhaps would like to help, but they're simply too cowardly to do so. So unless in the end uh, we shift for ourselves and look to places where we are appreciated, uh, then our children, or at best our grandchildren, uh, face just extinction in their own countries. Yeah. So, so, Nick, you are absolutely, well, having been a politician yourself, you're better able to talk about this because I've never been able to, to get my head around why, why nobody, nobody, it's in the press, nowhere, it's on radio, nowhere, it's on TV, nowhere, I've never been able to understand that, I just, I, I, for me, to have an entire population of white people murdered, tortured, burnt, raped, 
and nobody mentions it. How is that possible? It's it is an astounding thing, isn't it? It's 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 absolutely astounding. It's I think the it's a combination of the uh, the, the 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 left liberals uh, and uh, this extraordinarily Talmudic hatred of white and Christian people from a section of the Zionist elite. Um, in fact, in fact, really all the Zionist elite, not all Jews, some of them are on our side, but um, from the people who have an enormous amount of clout in the mass media uh, at the top level and then reinforced at the bottom level by unreconstructed Trotskyites of the 1968 generation. All these people have a fundamental hostility to white people uh, and to Christian culture. Uh, and the only people who might propose a counterbalance to that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the straightforward capitalist elite, who are just interested in money, well, to them, uh, an elderly white population, and in fact, unfortunately this is partly our problem, because around the world we've basically given up breeding, uh. so an, an elderly white population uh, doesn't uh, produce cheap labour, it doesn't produce large numbers of consumers, uh, so it's not really very interesting. So they go along with the uh, the uh, ultra-Marxist and the Talmudic hatred of our people, because there's no profit in white people anymore. But, and this is contentious, but if you look at the creators, the developers, the, 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 the who have they been throughout <laughs> yes. history? Not the other colours, Nick. No, indeed, indeed not. It's all, I mean, it's all fundamentally either short-sighted or evil to the point, it's so evil and so crazed that I don't think you have to be uh, a a really fervent believing Christian to feel that there's something satanic about what's going on uh, because it's it's simply beyond belief, it's beyond all normality, it's even beyond the interests of the people, the, 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 the personal and the group interests of the people who are doing it. Yes. Uh, it's, it, it's, just, it's just absolutely absolutely bizarre, incredible and and deeply disturbing. Because my thought has been always what is the end game? Because if the end game is to have a, a population of serfs, those elites at the top still need people to be creative and doing, which they're not going to have. So it is self-destructive. Do they not see that? Or do they absolutely not give a damn? I, I think certainly with some of them, certainly the politicians, and admittedly in the European Union, uh, I was there, you know, they're second and third rate politicians because the, the first rate ones are still there in their own countries, just busy busy destroying them in their own parliaments. But I think with a lot of them, they're innately, this may sound bizarre given what I've just said, they're innately not bad people. Uh, they simply, they've been brought up and educated in the same sort of schools, uh, in the same sort of ways. They genuinely believe, I think this is the crux of it, that uh, the uh, the war, and bear in mind the European Union and a lot of this stuff came out of the disasters of the first, then reinforced by the Second World War. They believe that war is very terrible, which indeed it is, uh, that uh, those First and Second World Wars were created by nationalism, which is debatable as an element of truth in it. Therefore, if you know, this, here's where the logical fallacy comes in, therefore if you do away with nationalism, you do away with war, to do away with nationalism, you have to do, with the, do away with the peoples. So doing away with the separate peoples of mankind, uh, with a particular reference to the whites, mm -hmm. uh, who after all also the technologists. Uh, so if it wasn't for us, wars would be fought with bows and arrows still, and they're not so dangerous and not mm -hmm. so destructive. Although the machete is bad enough in Rwanda. Uh, but uh, in, in their heads, if you get rid of white civilization, you get rid of um, you know, pollution and war, the whole climate change thing, it's a sort of religion where this uh, earth goddess has become the most important thing and there's a, a, a wicked carbon god in the sky uh, and unless we starve the carbon god and sacrifice all sorts of things to the earth mother, then we're going to suffer terribly. And these things, it's a sort of bizarre religion, the same with multiculturalism and the idea of total equality, all the rest of it, a sort of bizarre religion, but a lot of them actually genuinely believe that they're going to make the world, you know, a, a wonderful place. And I think historically, wherever you've had people who get this mentality, 
not just we're going to run our country, run our little part of the world as best we can, or even I'm going to run this part of the world as best as I can for myself. Uh, the, these are very different to that. These are the people who think, I'm going to create a paradise on Earth. And every time in history you've had uh, a, a leader or an ideology which says, we're going to perfect everything, those are the ones to watch for, because when people don't fit into their grand schemes, they make people fit by cutting off their legs and cutting off their heads. Mm, mm, absolutely. But, you know, for me, they, Africa, Africa especially South Africa, was the blueprint for the rest of the world. That, that, that's how I see it. If they could achieve this in South Africa without anybody stepping in with warlike intentions and physically and, and militarily bringing it to an end, then they could do it everywhere else. And they've had 22 years now to do it in South Africa, and it's worked. It has worked. But... Are they not looking at the bigger picture of what happens when you eliminate the whites? Look at Zimbabwe, Nick. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, indeed. Now, I remember well when it was Rhodesia. Um, in fact, when I was at university, I came within an inch of deciding to join the army when I left because my plan was to do the three years in the British Army and then go uh, and volunteer in Rhodesia. But, of course, before that came about, Margaret Thatcher sold the place out uh, and it was very clear what was going to happen to Zimbabwe, and it, as as always, took a few years. Uh, and now, yeah, it, it's finished, isn't it? And in, inevitably, South Africa will be the same, and inevitably, Germany will go the same way, and Britain and all the rest of it, because we're heading down the same road. You can't have a, a first world country dominated by a third world people. It just doesn't doesn't work. No, but. But if this were the grand experiment to see whether we built this utopia by getting rid of whites, surely they can see that they are creating basket cases. You know, uh, Rhodesia was the bread basket of Africa. It fed Africa. Mm -hmm. It fed Europe. It exported hundreds of tons of food. And now they've got their begging bowls out. We hate you whites. We're getting rid of the last white farmers, but please feed us. We will do you the favour, Robert Mugabe said recently, of accepting your aid. <laughs> I mean, really? Yes. Well, I, I think at an economic level, of course, when Rhodesia was producing grain for the rest of, uh, the rest of Africa, of course, the money from that was going primarily to... You know, farmers and their families and their workers, and there was nothing there for the corporate big boys. Whereas once you smash a society up, then and, and once it's gone past its collapse stage, that's still really to come. At a certain point, you can waltz in and take over the land and the minerals and so on for the the giant global corporations and for the international banking elite, and there'll be no resistance. And there, like you mentioned it earlier on, that. In the end, the, the New World Order, it's not about the, the overall good for the world. It's about the maximum profit for a tiny number of people. And if they can maximise their profits by destroying, uh, basically, if you like, the middle class worldwide at every level, uh, then they'll happily do so because this is about profit and power. Which they have done, because there is no middle class anywhere anymore. We are no, either upper class or totally living paycheck to paycheck. There's yes. no middle class, no matter where you look. Yeah. It's frightening, because I, when, when I lived in South Africa, I was upper middle class. Mm. Um, but that fast degenerated when I lost my job to four African people. They replaced mm -hmm. me with four Africans. And, and then I was very shortly lower class. And, and I, I will never recover from that. No, never. No. Even though I'm in America right now, I, I still do not qualify as middle class. No, and, and increasingly fewer Americans qualify as middle, yes, qualify as middle yes. class as they're... You know, push, push down into the masses, which is the inevitable and the, one of the intended cons consequences of mass immigration from cheap uh, labour countries, whether it's uh, Pakistan in Britain, uh, North Africa in Germany, or Mexico in the United States. 
But Nick, it doesn't make sense because in South Africa, this mass immigration from Zimbabwe, because they've got no food and no nowhere to stay in their own country and it's so violent there, so now they still want a piece of the, the apparently successful South Africa, mm -hmm. and they're flooding in there from all over Africa. And then when they get there, they open a little spaza shop where they sell uh, cigarettes and flour and a couple of things out of their garage. But then the locals attack them and necklace them because they're stealing their jobs. Yes, so, uh, see, so th yes. There is no way that this is working. No, no, it's a, it's a mad world. And as I said before, it's, it's so perverse and twisted. Uh, and illogical for everybody, for everybody, that um, you have to regard it as, in some way, directly and deliberately evil, rather than just uh, you know an accident or um, a question of the, the road to hell being paved with good intentions. This goes something far beyond that. But who, Nick? Because I certainly can't. Who can wrap their head around that amount of evil? Indeed, so that's that's part of the problem. The people look at one little part, one little symptom or another, uh, and don't really get the you know, the big picture, uh, and thereby can't put things right before it's too late. In the cases of the country, is well down the slippery slope, or find it difficult to keep their country off the start of the slippery slope if they're not there yet. You know, I'm spending a lot of time now uh, in Central Europe, and there. The, the attitude of their people and the governments of whatever political hue is very much more healthy than that in the West, but they still don't fully understand the, the scale of the danger. I think they're going to find out, well, uh, when large parts of Western Europe go up in flames in very short order, hopefully, in a bizarre way, that will happen quickly enough for countries like Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic and so on, uh, to say, well, we definitely don't want to go down that road uh, and not only put the barriers up, because um, there's no point putting barriers up unless behind the barriers you've got a, a young, vigorous population yes. to man the barriers and till the soil. Yes. And the, a whole, the whole of the Euro European peoples of the world have got a catastrophically low birth rate. And I regard the very best thing that's happening now as the fact that in some countries, uh, Hungary being a good example, the governments have finally began began to understand that demography is everything and are doing their best to encourage their own people to have children. Now, the blacks have been doing that forever because I, I've seen this example in Africa. that They consider their riches um, to be their children because the, the more children you have, the better you're going to be looked after in your old age. Yes. But they've also yes. been encouraged by the black governments to have more children. Yes. So in the apartheid years, the black population grew 920%. Well, I don't think that the, the white population decreased that by that amount, but they certainly decreased. That We've never grown more than 6 million whites in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Never, mm -hmm. never, never in the whole time that we've been there. Because we have a different view of that. We don't see our children as looking after us in our old age. We see us looking after them now, and we need the best for them now. So yes. we can't afford to do it if we have 13 children, or 22 like President Zuma has. Well, of course, we there again, we used to. You know, there was a time uh, in, in Victorian England, the, the, the uh, a mark of someone who, who'd made it, was that they had a large, healthy family because they could afford to have a large family. Yes. And it was not that long. It was Margaret Sanger and various, again, very sinister people at the very early stages of this who set about uh, discouraging people from having lots of children. And unfortunately, the, uh, the, the world's rabble, as she viewed them, she was very, very racist in these things, mm. did heed the message, uh, but the, the English middle and upper class did, with the result that... We went into the First World War with most of our better families having uh, one son and possibly one daughter, uh, and uh, they were duly exterminated in the trenches. And But it's the natural state of affairs is for what you describe the Africans having, uh, the idea that you know a large family is a blessing and a sort of insurance, uh, and uh, that's been beaten out of the peoples of Europe 
And again, we can't blame everybody else. It's our own stupidity and selfishness uh, has allowed that to happen. And a, a more far-sighted, um, for instance, nationalist movement in South Africa, I think would have uh, done very, very well indeed to say, well, we should mow our own grass, make our own beds and empty our own bins. We'll do it all ourselves and we're going to have lots of children to do it. Had they done that, then you still have a white nation in South Africa. But the minute you start thinking in terms of having them to do the dirty work yeah. and uh, and just having a little family of ours just to replace ourselves, then that's the that's the fatal mistake. It is a death knell for population, isn't it? It I, is. I mean, really. we became complacent in South Africa. No matter the reasons why we originally allowed them into our white, our white country, they came in to do the work. That is the reason we gave. We didn't have enough white people to do the mining and the... The, the street cleaning and the whatever and whatever. So we let them in to do it. And that was our problem because everybody had to have a maid. Everybody had to have a yes. gardener and sometimes more than one of them. So we did it to ourselves because yes. we were lazy. Yeah. Yes, absolutely so. And the same, obviously, in the United States earlier on with slavery. Uh, the same more recently in Western Europe with endless supplies, cheap labour, and cheap nannies and all the rest of it uh, for the for the lucky ones, uh, and of course they make the ordinary people pay for it all yeah. in terms of taxes and their own yeah. living standards and their own the cohesion of their own society. But uh, yeah, pl plenty of people short term benefit from these things. You know that when you talk about cheap labour, the again looking at South Africa, the most obvious thing is the mines. Yes. They could have had labour galore from Europe if they wanted it, but that would have meant paying a decent wage. But it's not just the giant mine owners, um, because the same is true of you know of farmers who wanted to farm their land naturally enough, but they felt it was acceptable to do it with dirt cheap black labour without realising that meant that their grandchildren or great-grandchildren would be forced off the land that they'd built and out of the country that their sweat and genius had built uh, because there wouldn't be enough of them to hold it. And like I said before, demographics is destiny. People have got to understand that. There's far too many people, perhaps some of your listeners, who regard themselves as nationalists, perhaps are very good nationalist activists, but you ask them how many kids have you got, and they look at, the, look at those, though you're mad, I haven't got time for that, I haven't got money for that, I don't want the, the hassle of trying to find a partner who'll be perfect, which of course nobody is. I'm scared of getting divorced and all the rest. So if it's okay by you, you know, I'll, I'll go through my life, I'll be a great nationalist activist, and when I die, there'll be no one there at my funeral um, because I'm not going to have kids. And it's it's an appalling error beyond belief. Uh, I come to the point to the point it's not um, self-serving because I no, I don't want to be a great nationalist leader. I've got plenty of things to do with my with my life. But I don't think that anyone should even be allowed to call themselves any kind of nationalist leader until they've got at least two kids. I, I absolutely agree, because as you said, it wasn't so very long ago that we had big families. I, I come from, from a family of five children, and my brother married into an Irish family where they had 13 children. So yeah. it, it was in our lifetimes where big families were still the norm. They were accepted, but now if you have more than two, people frown on you. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's something health, slightly healthy actually, uh, happening in Britain, whereby just the last few years, it's actually become a, a sign again, or sh is showing signs of becoming a thing again, where you know a, a large, successful upper middle class family, uh, they, they show up having several extra kids. I think there was, you, you forget all the conspiracy stuff for a moment, come down to a real practical problem, that in the days when all cars only had two front seats and two or at most three seats in the back, yeah. and cramped at that, it put a natural technological limit on a normal family yes. uh, and in the last few years of course there's all sorts of vehicles around now with five seats six seats seven seats nine seats uh, and uh, that's practically making it more feasible for a you know for a family to have kids but of course at the same time because so many people are being pushed down into a day-to-day a -day existence working or proletarian class so the mum has to go out to work you know, to make ends meet one salary can't possibly buy a house. It certainly mitigates against uh, large families. It mitigates against families at all. Uh, and it's 
it's got to it's got to be put right if we're going to survive. Do you think that is why this whole worldwide uh, same sex marriage is being pushed so hard? Is because kids don't come from that? Uh, no, I think the the pushing for same sex marriage uh, is part of the uh, particularly the uh, the Trotskyite. Uh, permanent revolution, destruction of Christian society, which came out of the Frankfurt comes out of the Frankfurt School, where for any of your, your listeners who aren't familiar with it, they need to go and look at it. The, the Frankfurt School basically were a school of revisionist Marxists in Germany, as the name suggests, in the in the nineteen twenties, and they started looking at well, what's happened here because Marx um, prophesied, and of course he must be right. The great prophet Marx <laughs> said that. Uh, it would be the most advanced societies, i.e. European societies, which would have the communist revolution first, and the less advanced societies would have it afterwards. And yet here we have Russia, which was a still almost a serf state in many ways, had the revolution first, and the uh, the peoples of the Western nations, of the nations of Central and Western Europe, are simply refusing to have a revolution. What's gone wrong? And the revisionists among the, uh, the Marxists uh, and the Trotskyites came to the conclusion that it was because the peoples in the West had the false conscious, consciousness of Christianity and bourgeois society, uh, and that inoculated them against revolution. So to have the revolution, you have to destroy the society and the nation and the Christian morals, which were in the way of it. So they developed this cultural critique whereby everything connected with those things which were in the way of the communist revolution, had to be criticised, 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 and mocked and mocked and mocked, and legislated against when the possibilities arose, until they fell apart. So our society, our culture, our morals, our traditions, have been deliberately, systematically, and relentlessly attacked by this very effective fifth column for many decades now. And the attack on uh, the rights of children and on the tradition and the institution of marriage, and therefore the, the existence of the family. It's not an accident. It's not just a thing by uh, a group of uh, rather chip-on-the-shoulder homosexuals. It's a deliberate part of the war against our civilization. So this current Pope, then, is also a deliberate part of this thing, because he is advocating uh, one religion, um, Islam is no different from Christianity, yes. so we must rename Christianity to Chrislam or some such thing. Yes. And gay marriage is perfect. We, we're awful if we speak out against it because, well, um, it's not unbiblical at all. So he, as a, a world leader of millions, millions yes. of believers, is there not by chance? No, I, 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 I think you're right. I mean, I think he may well be uh, a grotesquely brainwashed and confused individual rather than anything worse, although that, God knows, is bad enough when he got as much power as he has, because he has done, to my knowledge, at least two good things. Uh, one with the attempt, the serious attempt at a reconciliation with the Orthodox Church, with the, the meeting in Cuba, uh, which, if you don't happen to be Catholic or Orthodox, sort of seems, oh, well, oh, well that's nice, sort of, so for what? But really in terms of healing a, a fundamental and drastic division in Christianity in Europe, that's a very important thing. Uh, and in practical short terms, it was very, very noticeable that just before Russia intervened in Syria to save the not just the Christians there, but in fact to save all civilization there and to stop a truly monstrous creature getting an enorm enormous amount of extra power and thereby threatening all of us even more, just before Putin made that intervention, he met with the Pope, uh, and it's literally a couple of days before, and clearly he must have told him, and clearly he got his blessing to, mo to move in and help protect the Christians there. So that's two good things, one on a sort of a, meta a, a, a religious level, and the other at a deeply practical level, two good things that this Pope's done. But you have to balance against that, as you said, his appalling attitude on many other things, you know, social doctrine and so on, and, and particularly the uh, the gay marriage and the Islam thing, where uh, at, at best the man, to use an English phrase, is as mad as a box of frogs. Yes, uh, you know, just I couldn't believe when the when the 
first pope ever to step down, step down, and this man was voted in. I knew you. You just had to know if you if you have two brain cells, you had to know that they, this was uh, by scheme. It was. It yes. wasn't. It wasn't some unplanned thing. It was you will step down because we need this man right now. Yes, I think there's. You're right. There's a, a, an increasing sign of haste. Uh, really dangerous and stupid haste on behalf of these various globalists and one-worlders. I think they see that the the time is running out for the stability of their economic system. That's very, very clear. Yeah. The, the sheer volumes, trillions and trillions of dollars floating around the world in a system that really no one controls anymore, not even them. Uh, there's the potential for it all to go terribly wrong, for there to be a backlash against everything that's gone on, uh, especially the uh, the rise of an independent-minded Russia that champions uh. sovereign states and human differences. That was not supposed to happen. Uh, and the uh, the dollar and the uh, the dollar empire is the the heart, the core of the power. And the dollar and the American war machine is the the core of the power of these people. Uh, and, and we're very very close to the the Russians, the Chinese, and many other nations saying, you know what, keep your dollar. We're going to create our own currency. The minute that happens, that there's an alternative reserve currency to the, the dollar so that the, the petrodollar no longer recycles, ah. then the the people running the United States will simply not have the money to buy off the people of the United States with, with en enough handouts uh, to uh, to keep things stable. So I think there's a, a serious panic and they, the people running the globalist show want to finish the job get rid of the separate nations, get rid of the separate peoples, complete the, the mass indoctrination of you know, the next generation uh, before it all goes horribly wrong and they lose control. Also, there is finally, in the, in the last eight months or so, an absolute uprising. It's slow and it's small, but there is an uprising amongst the common people, which I don't yes. think that they bargained on. No, I, I think you're right. And they may, I mean, many of the people who are perceived and presented by the liberal media as being, you know, the next worst thing to Genghis Khan and Adolf Hitler rolled together, many of them actually are very soft, very moderate, fundamentally liberal and confused, uh, and not capable of organising an effective fight back against anything. Mm. But the fact that the public are turning to them, and I think, for instance, in France, a Marine Le Pen, who is a very clever political operator, but she's nothing like the genuine nationalist hero that her father has been. Um, so she won't really change France, but the fact that people are sort of turning to her and looking to her in huge numbers, despite all the obstacles thrown in the way, indicates a, a terrible instability. Then you get a, 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 a loose cannon like Donald Trump comes along. Mm. And does anyone know what Donald Trump will do? Whether, he'll, whether he will simply uh, sell out all the promises and, and implied promises and create some kind of kleptocracy for himself and his cronies in the United States? Or will he actually be the uh, you know, get to power on uh, what appears to be a, uh, a, a rather unformed program and then turn out to be a genuine revolutionary uh, who, on behalf of the American people, deals with the people who have been trying to get rid of us all? No, no one knows, and I think it's that instability and uncertainty. And if the public can vote, even if they're voting for a phony or a safety valve, if they can elect a phony and a safety valve uh, in a country or another, well, if they can do that with a phony, then the next time around they may do it with someone who's genuine. So they, the, the, th the people who want to take the world have a very limited amount of time in which to do it, so they're doing it very fast, and let's hope they make some mistakes. Well, I just see that we, the people, are going to suffer from their mistakes. I mean, we've suffered so badly under the, their direct control that once they start falling apart, the world is going <laughs> yes. to go through a very, very bad stage of upheaval. Yes, indeed. I don't know if you're aware, most of your American listeners won't be, uh, there was a, uh, a, a senior figure in the British military establishment uh, in, I think it was 2006, uh, a Rear Admiral Richard Parry. Uh, and uh, he gave a speech in which he said that uh, the, the combination of mass immigration and particularly Islam was such that uh, Europe faced a collapse of civilization, quote, 
on the scale of the collapse of the Roman Empire within 10 years unless something was done. Uh, and he was pulled up on this, of course, by the liberal elite, the BBC and all the rest, uh, and who demanded his sacking. And the head of the British Armed Forces uh, said, no, he didn't say it's going to happen. He said it will happen unless something's done. And we stand by that. Uh, and that was it. So, of course, nothing has been done. And it's now 10 years down the line. And he prophesied, for instance, huge hordes of people across the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean becoming unsafe uh, for ordinary shipping and so on. Uh, and everything he said was going to happen is coming to pass within the time scale he said in about 10 years. Uh, and when you look at what's happening in Germany, Sweden, Britain, France, it, it's utterly unsustainable, very, very clearly. The whole thing's a powder keg. And because of modern information technology and so on, when the minute one city goes up seriously in flames, whether it's as a result of an accident, you know, a policeman runs over a Muslim demonstrator uh -huh. or something, or whether it's deliberate with ISIS and Al-Qaeda deliberately setting out to spark a civil war, whichever it is, when it starts in one city, it'll spread to all the others in that country. When it starts in one country, it'll spread to the whole of Western Europe in a matter of a few weeks, and the place will be in flames. Uh, and it's one aside on that. It's very, very clear to me, a seasoned political ana analyst, the analyst that when you see uh, the likes of George Soros and President Obama pushing people and pushing Europe in the same direction, at the same time as they're pushing Europe towards having a civil, being involved in a war in Ukraine, uh. Uh, that it's very, very clear, in fact, that there are people who want to see Europe in chaos, that it's in the interest, it's obviously not in the interests of ordinary Americans who, you know, I know have, you know, family and ancestral connections here, you know, love Europe and its history, regard themselves as of European stock and so on. It's not in their interest to have chaos in Europe, but from the, the geopolitical point of view of the neocons, the people who make, really make deep policy in Washington, they said the project for the new American century, the, the core of the neocon project around about 1999, when they were plotting the war in Iraq to destabilize the Middle East on behalf of uh, oil companies, uh, the American multinationals, and the, and the Zionists within Israel, when they were doing that, they also said that no power should be allowed to uh, compete with uh, America economically. And to me, it's plain as a pike staff that the, the threat of Europe led economically and socially by Germany, forming a, a, bit, a working business relationship with Russia, with its enormous you know, mineral resources and space, and in turn then a link through to, uh, through to China, with its huge manufacturing base, that threat would mean the end of uh, Wall Street's domination of the world. And to stop that threat, they're quite prepared to create war and civil war in Europe to tear the, tear the place apart. And I think that's what we're going to see very, very soon. Wow. Well, we're coming up to a station break. And um, after that, I'd like to talk to you about BRICS, because I think that is something that people are not really talking about. And it's instrumental in what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. OK, well, I look forward to coming back. Let's um, go and have a drink and come back in a few minutes' time. Thank you very much, Nick. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to Radio Free South Africa. This is your host, Karen Smith. And our guest tonight is Nick Griffin, formerly of the British BNP and now Vice President of the, of the Alliance for Peace and Freedom in Europe. Welcome back, Nick. Thank you, Gary. So before the break, we were, go, we were threatening to talk about BRICS because I think this is a very important part of, of South Africa's story, not necessarily for the rest of the world, but, but probably as you were talking about the them forming their own bank, their own currency, and being a huge threat to the United States as the, the, the top commercial financial ruler of the world. So BRICS, they <laughs> were forming their own monetary fund. They were doing all sorts of things. And I don't know where they are at with those things right now. There was well, certainly, I, I think they perhaps attending to uh, I don't know who came up with the BRICS idea. It was possibly a Western concept. I don't really think that they regard South Africa as as a key part of this. Yeah, it's it's an also ran with some inter some interesting mineral reserves, and that's about it. Uh, but the and I don't know um, Brazil 
South America is obviously a long way, sort of geopolitically, away mm. from the, the Eurasian heartland. Uh, and what's happening there is very, very interesting. The, the more that the, uh, uh, the global elites are pushed against uh, Russia as a punishment in the end for Putin stopping the oligarchs uh, and the West looting the whole country to death, uh, the more they pushed against Russia, uh, the more the, uh, the Russians and the Chinese and the more the American Navy interfere in the far Pacific, uh, the more it has this effect on them as well. It's bringing those powers together. Uh, and they've, at, the mo at these very minutes, they've signed all the main agreements and they're now coming up with all the contracts to create what they call uh, the New Great Silk Road. And the New Great Silk Road is basically a railway network which will connect the, all the cities, the main industrial cities of China, right the way to the Pacific coast, uh, all the way through Asia, all the way through Russia, uh, and then uh, if the European Union will do what German business wants them to, all the way through Western Europe as well, with the result that instead of uh, a container load of consumer goods made in China taking more than a month to travel round, uh, the, uh, the, round the Cape of Africa and so on, uh, and up by ship, uh, they'll move them to Western Europe in three days flat. Uh, it's an immense, it's a hugely complicated and ambitious project to basically turn the the world's economic center, uh, or to turn rather sort of Russia and, and Asia into the economic center of the world. Uh, and it completely bypasses everything the people running the United States have been doing for decades. And it's not now, this isn't a question of is it going to happen. As I say, the contracts are already being signed. The work's already starting. Uh, so uh, that's what the, uh, the brick part, in any case, or uh, perhaps even the ick, Part, uh, of, but the Rick, in fact, would be Russia, mm. India, China, uh. and primarily Russia and China. That's what they're up to. Uh, and I think that the South Americans will see which side their bread's buttered. Do they go with this real uh, economic giant or do they go with the United States, which in economic terms has been a little bit of a recovery because of shale oil and so on, although at enormous environmental cost. But in the end, the United States is a, a massively indebted basically bankrupt monster, uh, which now has economically a third world profile. Most of its exports in value terms are raw materials. Mm. You know, it was once obviously the, uh, after Britain, after the, the end of Britain, it became the industrial workshop of the entire world. It, it, it ran the Second World War to a large extent. You know, this colossus, economic colossus. And I was in Detroit now years ago, and I remember seeing just the shattering vision of Detroit you know, the motor city of the world, uh, and now there's trees grow basically growing in the streets uh, and deer roaming just a, a few, almost a few yards away from the very centre because the, the place is hollowed out and it's finished. And that's really the story, sadly, of the economy of the once great United States. Yeah, it's all gone to China, hasn't it? It's all gone to China, yeah. So I think that the S in BRICS then was because of the strategic importance of South Africa because those ships had to round the Horn yes. of Africa. Yes, you've put, you put your finger on it, and that's why now it doesn't matter anymore. Because once this, once this is done, um, ships around the world, or, or ships to Europe, won't be needed anymore. Uh, not even going for the Suez Canal, they simply won't be needed. Uh, so if we are importing anything from the Americas, they'll come across the Atlantic. And if we're importing stuff or transporting stuff within Eurasia, it'll go by rail. So little South Africa stuck on the end of the world doesn't matter. Uh, because that's always seemed to me, well, it was strategically important. That's why it was originally settled, was mm. to have a refreshment post for the ships rounding the horn. Yes, indeed. And then it's why it was so viciously fought over in, in proxy wars in the Cold War time with the uh, so-called freedom fighters in Mozambique and Angola and so on. Mm. Um, yeah, and but this, this, now it's this coming makes it irrelevant. irrelevant. It makes it totally irrelevant. If 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 this is going to happen, South Africa yes. has lost any strategic mm. importance whatsoever. Because yes, it has minerals, but so does Russia. Yes, indeed, it'll just become a Chinese quarry. Which it uh, is. in fact, that's the, that's probably the phrase of the fate now of most most of Africa: a Chinese quarry and a place where foreign multinationals and 
um, Muslim petrol state um, uh, sovereign wealth funds come in and buy up vast amounts of land uh, to run as farms for food for export. Uh, and the, the desperate population that results, well, they'll ship them to ship them to Europe as cheap labour and to finish off the destruction of Europe. Yeah, because you can see that already. The Chinese own such enormous tracts of Africa right now, already. Yes. Already. So then I have to wonder, why have the Russians signed this contract to build six nuclear power stations in South Africa? I guess because they reckon that they'll get their, they'll get their money, uh, and uh, the, the Russians are, it's, it's a major export for them. They are under severe economic pressure still because of the, the sanctions and all the, uh, and, and all the uh, attacks on them from the USA and, and, and the European Union. Uh, so they've got to do business where they can, and they don't, uh, they, they specialise in big scale civil engineering projects like this yeah. and in nuclear power. I'm quite sure that they're, uh, they're sharp enough and they've shown in Syria they have the capability uh, that uh, any state they do a deal with which tries and reneges on that and stitches them up is uh, going to find that they're in trouble. So I'm sure that they've looked at South Africa and concluded, we'll build these, and if in the end the South Africans can't pay, well, we'll take payment in kind in terms of this quarry and that quarry and whatever else uh, we want. Uh, and so working into that plan so well right now is the fact that Anglo-American is pulling out of South Africa. Um, a lot of the mines are closing down. Uh, even the coal mines are closing. Um South Africa going bankrupt, I mean, they're almost at junk status. That they, They're holding yes. their heads above that by, I don't know what, I don't know how they're managing, but they are. So that ties in perfectly with that, because those nuclear power stations could export power to the rest of Africa, well, to the rest of southern sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. anyway. Yes. So they'll yes. make their money no matter what. And yes. could, if they go in, now, you reneged on this deal. The re Africa's in an uproar. We we will just come in and keep the peace. Uh, so yes. We're not yeah. looking at peacekeepers from, from Europe or from America. We're looking at peacekeepers from, from China and Russia coming in yes. and yeah, saying, sure. okay, we will now take over this country and run it our way. It, it's, it works for me. That works for me. Yes, could, uh, that could well be. That could well be. You know, the, the other plan of, of the USA going in and saving Africa doesn't work for me at all. I don't see why they would do that. No, I, I, I don't think they're capable of doing it either, as a matter of fact. No. Um, whereas the, the Chinese have the numbers and the, uh, the, Russia, the Russians have the grit uh, and the re really the military capability in a way that all the Western powers have lost. Uh, so, yeah, they, they may well do that. So I think the BRICS was probably the thing started off perhaps more or less under the control of the of the globalists. So I think it's developed a, a, a life of its own and it's it's wandering off to do its own thing. Absolutely, because Putin said he will not have any part of this New World Order thing and there are many, many articles saying he stands in the way of it. So, yes. but now, okay, so Putin disappears from the scene. The whole The whole picture could change, or could it? Well, the thing you have to understand with Russia, as far as I get it, and I think it was Churchill who said that uh, Russia is a, a mystery wrapped in, a, in an enigma or something uh, similar. Uh. So it is a confusing thing. But what I do know is that Putin isn't, he's not a one-off. He's not just the, he's not a sole figurehead uh, just doing his own thing while the rest of Russia just sort of looks on and scratches its head. He's a sort of uh, avatar, avatar, a sort of symbolic figurehead for a, a far bigger um, way of looking at the world, which is within Russia, which is this um, sort of Russian empire as one of the sovereign states, a multipolar world, uh, and st individual state sovereignty being important. Uh, the, the settlement idea of the Treaty of Westphalia, uh, that you know, states shouldn't interfere in each other and so on. Um, they, they really believe this, uh, and it's not just him. There's a whole, um, there's a whole ideological movement within Russia which uh, which stands for these things. They're not in complete power. They're still uh, basically around Medvedev 
uh, the Prime Minister and so on, and around the central bank, there are still people who basically will be happy to play second fiddle to the people running the, running the Western world. Uh, but the, uh, the, the element that Putin represents and epitomises has the upper hand, and it's probably, especially in the wake of their staggering success in Syria, mm. will continue to, continue to have the upper hand. So even if the West managed to do away with Putin in some way or another, they, it, that doesn't mean that this new uh, Russia as the head of a multipolar world mm. just disappears. It's highly unlikely to. They could actually quite easily end up with someone who's more ideological, more of a nationalist, because in the end, Putin is not... He's not a Russian nationalist. He's certainly not a Russian racist. Yeah, he's running a deliberately and uh, intentionally and happily running a multicultural empire in which Muslims pay a very large, significant and very loyal part. Their Muslims are completely different, uh, the majority of them, to the, uh, the ones that we managed to import into the West mm. and that Obama's importing as quickly as possible oh. into Minnesota and so on. Uh, and uh, if, if Russia became uh, a Russia which was just for white Russians, it would shrink to being a large country and no way like a superpower. Yes. Uh, so even so, even if Putin goes, this strange to us sort of imper Russian imperial thing, uh, which still recognises and is prepared to lay its treasure and its men on the line to protect the the sovereignty of other people and Christians in other countries, this strange and rather refreshing thing will, I think, go on. It is very strange, is it not? So, but then then we come to this again, Nick. So. South Africa belongs to BRICS, and South Africa is communist rule. There's no, there, there's no two ways about that. I mean, that you know, if you listen to Malema, who's the up and coming president, I don't see any way around yes. that right now. I don't see yeah. any way around it. He is being groomed for that position. Mm -hmm. His latest tour of of Britain and Europe, where he went to the universities in Oxford and got standing ovations for his. And nationalism, and we're going to mm -hmm. we're going to nationalize everything, and uh, you know we're going to get rid of the whites, or they must just toe the line, etc. He got a standing ovation from those liberal students. Yes. He's being groomed. He would never have been able to do this kind of world tour and be such a hero uh, unless yes. he, he had yeah. backing. Yeah, you know he's an ignorant little boy who who really came from nowhere, has got nothing worthwhile to listen to except violence. Mm -hmm. Yep. He has to have strong backing somewhere. But he is being groomed for that position, and Azuma is being set up right now for an enormous fall. Uh-huh. Well, that, that's my opinion. If, if, you, yes. if you just look at what's happening, you, you, you can't see it any other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, now, where do the Russians... Uh, communism has failed everywhere. It, it, it's just not a success. It's been tried. It doesn't work. But South Africa is firmly... Firmly communist. How, how, yes. how does that make any sense? I, I, I don't know, because certainly the Russians are not communist. Mm -mm. They're very, very firmly post-communist. Yes. It is strange. It was, it was in Belarus, Belarus recently. To give you an example of how strange it is, these people are committed to... Uh, they, they've re-Christianized the country on a, on a grand scale. There's, there's, as, as in Russia, there's new churches everywhere. And they're, and they're packed. Uh, Catholic churches and Orthodox churches alike. They're full of the gunnels of people, you know, young and old. Uh, so they're genuinely non-communist, but they look back with a certain degree of nostalgia and even affection to elements of the old system. You know, they, they had a system, they had a health service which worked, and after 1989, Russia was looted senseless by the oligarchs and by the West. Mm. Uh, the, the life expectancy of ordinary Russians crashed, crashed by years, um, you know, they went from a, a job for life to basically no jobs, no food. Yes. Um, okay, under communism, they didn't have much choice in the food stakes, but the staples were there. Uh, and so they, they were nostalgic for that. And even though they've now got a better system, which is coming up and doing better and creating a middle class, and the life expectancy is rising again, despite all that, they still have a certain affection for aspects of the communist time when it was stable, when they were invaded by one of the most efficient and ruthless armies the world has ever known and defeated it because with respect both to British and American um, 
uh, veterans, uh, what we did compared with the Russians was virtually zero. The Russians were the ones who defeated Nazism, nobody else. Um, it, it, uh, Britain would never have done it, Western Europe would never have done it, uh, and the United States would have taken a decade or more. That was done by Russia, mm. and they're very, very proud of all that. So I was at a, a military park, sort of all about the, cold, the Second World War and the Cold War, sort of tourist attraction in Belarus, quite near Minsk. Uh, and they got there, uh, well, there was a big statue of Stalin, a big buster statue, on top of a small hill overlooking the park in Pride of Place. Uh, and they've recently decided they didn't want that because they're a post-communist state. So they've removed Stalin and they built a, a lovely little Orthodox church in Pride of Place on top of this hill overlooking the park. But then they put they reinstalled Stalin on a plinth just below the church. So this man who closed the churches, who murdered priests and believers in their millions, is nevertheless, and he's, and he's covered in garlands, not with graffiti and all the rest yes. of it, is nevertheless regarded as a sort of uh, state hero and, and people's hero, because under his rule, the th things did change. And obviously we were taught, you know, I, I, used to, I spent parts of my uh, youth literally fighting the communists in the streets. You know, I'm not a communist sympathiser at all. Um, but nevertheless, all we saw was the, the stories, the truth and the propaganda about how terrible it was. And they saw a different thing. They saw a system which did work, which in some ways, as long as you were on the right side of the authorities, was better than what went before, ah. which, did, which did throw back the Nazis. And they're very pleased to have changed it. They're very glad to have got rid of it all. They're extraordinarily attached to their Christian heritage, and they're aware that under the communists, uh, you know, there was mass murder of uh, Christians at every level. Uh, but they still have a certain respect and sympathy for that communist experiment, whereby, even though it wasn't, it wasn't Russian at all, it was imposed on them as a sort of colour revolution from Wall Street, just like more recently in Ukraine. Yes. Uh, but because of that, they'll look at something like South Africa and the fact that the Africans sort of apparently want to become communist, and it doesn't say to them the terrible things that it says to us. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I kind of get that, because being a South African, uh, oh, you might not like this, but being a South African, we have a sort of love-hate relationship with the British. Yeah, of course, um, yes. Yeah. And you know why, you know the history of it, yes. you know where it comes from, you know that there's still resentment between English-speaking and Afrikaans-speaking South Africans. It, it, it yes. just is like that. But yeah. we never tore down the statues of Cecil John Rhodes. We never... We, we, we never... Yeah, I, I think that's... I think it's a very, very good analogy, actually. Very, very... Yeah, absolutely so. I can I can imagine that really... That pretty much sums it up. And there was, it, there was every reason uh, for, uh, for the Afrikaners to do so. But it wasn't done, and there's this sort of um, an ambivalent attitude, and a yes, there were wrongs done, but let's 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 move on and not 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 um, fixate about what's in the past. Yes, so I'm see I'm seeing that similarity between those two, the, the the story you've just told me about that church and a statue, and and the fact that it's now the blacks who are tearing down the statues of the British heroes mm -hmm. um, in yes. South Africa. It is not mm -hmm. the white people who had good reason to yes, hate absolutely. the Brits. Yes. They, yeah. they never did that. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they said, okay, well, yes, we hate what you did during the Boer War. Yes, we hate that you killed 20% of our people in concentration yeah. camps. We will never, never forgive that. But Rhodes had a part in the history of this country and he belongs there and yes. now suddenly it's the blacks who have no reason whatsoever to hate Cecil John Rhodes are the ones who want to tear a statue down it doesn't make sense Nick no no but that's just the way that uh, these the, the, these things are except uh, and the, the European peoples are probably unique in being able to put themselves in the other man's shoes yes. and to, em to empathise with the other side and thereby to understand them to, ex to an extent. And even a small amount of understanding gives rise, not, not to a sympathy, but to a certain degree of uh, a, a non... Uh, when I talk about tolerance, I'm not talking about the 
soft, soppy, pink, sloppy, no, no, sickly, no, no, sickly no. variety that comes out of liberalism, but a, but a genuine, sensible tolerance, uh, whereby, yes, it's a statue, and what harm does it does, and it's part of our history, and different peoples can take different things from it, and let's, you know, let's move on, because we've got better things to do than worry about uh, things that were done, you know, 100 years ago, and uh, I mean, it, it's remarkable, I think, from the from the Africana position, because as I see it from a distance, in in most conflicts, say in Northern Ireland with the Protestants and the Catholics, or in Poland on the Polish-German border between the Poles and the Germans, or in former Yugoslavia between the Croats and the Serbs, in most of these conflicts, one side is as right as the other, and both sides have been as wrong and as brutal as the other. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, they they have to try and get along from that point. As I see it, as you know, as a Brit, the, the history of South Africa, I can't see. Maybe I'm missing something, but I've never seen anything whereby uh, the Afrikaners seriously wrongs the uh, the English. Whereas what the British Empire did to the Afrikaners was nothing sort of short short of major war crimes, moving towards genocide. Uh, and so you know if. If anyone should be unable to forgive and to put up with a, uh, and not be able to put up with the statue of Cecil Rhodes, the Afrikaners would have the right to take that position. And the fact that they didn't, I know there was you know, talk of discrimination and so on and so forth, and there's a, a South African war film I've seen where they, I've forgotten the name of it, where the English-speaking recruit gets hell from the, from the Afrikaner sergeant. But that, you know, that, that apart, that's, that's hardly grand-scale uh, wrong against the people. No. in a way that, say, happened between Poles and Germans on both sides. And I think the, the Afrikaners were remarkably tolerant when they did finally get control of, of their country. The shame is that they then instituted a system which looked like it was going to be one which would preserve them forever, but which was actually um, really just taking a, a different route to the same end that English liberalism would have done. Yes, you see... That, that's one of the things I feel about South Africa, is that the, the British influence in South Africa is still very prevalent. If, if you look at our, at our judges and magistrates, they wear the little white wigs, you know, that, yes. <laughs> yep. you know, our parliamentary system is based on the British system. There yep. is such a huge British influence still. Mm -hmm. In South African life, although the, the the British have not been there since the 1960s, when we got our independence, but their influence remains, and it remains even on the blacks to this day. Because I, I can't help it. I giggle so helplessly when I see one of these black magistrates with this little white dirty wig. I, 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 I do as well. I mean, uh, the, the sorry farce of the thing they call a parliament. Um, yeah. oh, you know, trying, oh my trying goodness. to pretend to be a, a British style parliament and it's it's actually really very funny to watch it um, or it would be if it wasn't for the fact that there's still the lives of you know millions of good people um, at the at the mercy of these lunatics and incompetence aren't they absolute clowns Nick they if, are, if yes. you look at the disaster that is our parliament I mean when my husband came to South Africa to meet me um, we watched parliamentary television because it's live on TV there. And he watched this a couple of times. And eventually it became our comedy hour. He would watch <laughs> Parliament and kill himself. He would roll on the floor laughing. He said, how is this possible that this bunch of circus clowns are ruling this country? Yes, can I just and, say, by the way, to, to any of the listeners who haven't perhaps seen this, and do, do go on YouTube uh, and... Uh, you know, do a little bit of imaginative searching in terms of um, uh, South African Parliament shambles, fast joke. You will find some things which, as Karen said, they, it really is a comedy hour. It's tremendous stuff. It is. It's fantastic. But they rule the country. You know, I mm. mean, if, if if you look at it from a serious point of view, uh, it, it, it's dreadful. I mean, if you can sit rolled on the floor laughing, but you have to understand that those people control the lives of seventy. <laughs> million South Africans. Yes, yes, indeed. Then, it, then it's not such a laughing matter, is it? No, it isn't. And and I mean, uh, Ray, my husband, he just said, how do they swear like that? In, in, in Parliament, on live TV, how, how, do, how do they do this? I mean, they wave their fists at each other and the F word flies and, uh, you know, it, it's unbelievable the things that go on there. But that... 
that encapsulates for me that entire country. Yes. If, if yeah. you're looking at it from the outside, it's a circus. But mm -hmm. if your life, your real life depends on that, it's not so funny anymore, Nick. No, oh, indeed. No, I can imagine. Yeah. You know, and uh, we were talking oh. earlier about, uh, about, about Julius Malema. Now, the, my biggest fear, and, and those of many South Africans, is that Julius Malema is going to end up in control of South Africa. Now, the elections are coming up, and it is very strange that in the lead-up to these elections, this is what is happening. The American press, which has not said one single word about South Africa except for the St. Mandela's death, Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that you've ever... Oh, and, and Oscar Pistorius's trial because oh, yes. he was a white man and he killed somebody. So now this becomes a worldwide drama. But yeah. those are the only things that have come out of South Africa in years. Yes, the same in Britain too, in our media. Yeah. Now suddenly, the Washington Post is writing articles about President Zuma. And not very flattering articles either. Now, to me, if you join the dots, this means Zuma has to fall because they're calling for his downfall. Now, in the history of South Africa, Malema was instrumental in getting the youth vote and ousting President mm -hmm. Mbeki and putting Zuma in power. He was instrumental because he has got an enormous, disaffected, unemployed, unemployable youth at his beck and call. They admire this man hugely. Mm -hmm. So now why, after 20 years of absolute silence on the subject of South Africa politics or any other thing coming out of South Africa, do we suddenly have these newspapers writing huge, huge, and not just a little column, huge articles about the failures of President Zuma? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why do we have this little boy, Malema, being lionized by a certain element of British public, the, mm -hmm, the, the mm -hmm. young liberals in particular, who is backing him and why? You can only assume that this is his time and he is the next president. Yes, I, I think I feel you're probably right. Yeah. Now, if we talk about the whites in South Africa, this man and his followers are going to be the extinction of white South Africans because he has said so. His first run of the EFF in the last elections was based on that banner, the honeymoon is over for whites in South Africa. Mm -hmm. That was his election banner. Now, he is a staunch follower of Mad Bob Mugabe in Zimbabwe. He has been to Cuba to find out how it is best done. He has said nationalization of everything is the only answer because the whites still control the economy in South Africa, which has been proven time and time again to be absolutely incorrect. Mm -hmm. But... He wants to boycott APSA Bank, which amazingly, just after he said that, Barclays Bank sold their share in APSA uh -huh. and are leaving. Uh -huh. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing that one of the first people to leave South Africa when sanctions were imposed, Barclays Bank, are now leaving Africa, not just South Africa, right after Malema threatens them? Mm. Amazing. Mm. Isn't it amazing? It is. Yes, it is. So, he threatens to nationalize the mines. Anglo-American leave or are in the process of mm -hmm. leaving. Now, they've been part of South Africa since the very, very beginning. During Cecil John Rhodes' days when diamonds and, my, and, and um, De Beer started those yes. diamond and gold mines, Anglo-American have been part of South Africa in one way or another since then. Now Malema threatens to nationalize and they pick it's up stakes and leave. Yes, yep. 
Now, does this not tell you that there are very big forces and important rich forces behind Milena? Yes, yep, certainly so. Certainly so. And at the, and at the very least, that others who aren't part of that game understand just how serious the risk is mm. and, and, and getting out while they can, which yes. is what I have to say. You know, although I understand very, very well as a, a staunch fighting patriot, um, I understand what you know, those Boers who say, well, you know, we've been here longer than the blacks have, which of course is true, and yes. they, at least the southern part of the country. Uh, you know, our forefathers built this land, they died here, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't leave. I understand that completely, but I think it's totally wrong headed because there is nothing in South Africa for white people except a future of death. And they if, if they can get out and their children get out, they can get out. I know it's extraordinarily difficult, but um, as we spoke in, in the, the lead up to this programme, I'm 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 working with several colleagues uh, to make the contacts needed in Central and Eastern Europe uh, with uh, people, including governments, who understand very well that uh, the they won't perhaps put it as the white race, but they understand that's what we're talking about all over the world is in peril, that their own demographics are very unhealthy. They need um, new populations uh, to, to augment their population. They all have a history, Hungary being a good example, Russia will be another one, they have a, a, a long history, in fact, of taking and genuinely assimilating uh, ethnic minorities, Germans and others, um, and allow, so turning them into loyal citizens of their country, but still being happily, happy to allow them to have uh, their own church, their own language, their own community um, habits, practices and traditions. Uh, and, you know, that's gone on for hundreds of years. It's, they've got a... a, a um, an experience of assimilation quite different to that of Western powers like Britain and France, where everybody just comes in and becomes British. You know, yeah. so the Irish who came to Britain within a generation, you know, other than the surname, they forget their Irishness and so on. It's not like that in Central and Eastern Europe. You have these communities who keep their own traditions and identity while being part, a loyal part of the overall. Uh, and so they're used to that. Some of them are looking with increasing interest at the Boers. Uh, others, of course, basically think, well, they're from Africa. We don't want Africans in our country. Yes, it's, yes. As, it's as, as simple as that. And so yeah. we've, so we, we, we've got a lot to get past. But if we can uh, open those doors, then I do hope that people will, will take the opportunity because the uh, you could still have a, uh, a Boer community speaking Afrikaans and so on, uh, uh, having its own land, its own community places in Hungary or Belarus or Russia, 300 years after they've been there, they would still be, uh, you know, part of that part of that nation. Yes. Whereas if they stay in South Africa for we don't know, three months time, six months time, two years time, four years time, they will be murdered on mass. Everybody knows what's coming, uh, and it's it's not as if it's not being telegraphed when you've got the the future president. Me openly boasting about it. Yeah. Um, you know what? Why should anyone be surprised when it happens? And happen it will. And I think you know I've I've studied the you know the the, uh, the Arania, um project and what they've done there is marvelous with the the schools and turning a a, a real rough piece of desert into a, a fertile, productive, and valuable place. But with fourteen, fifteen hundred people there, presumably not even allowed to own effective firearms, how long are they going to survive when there's thousands of desperately starving blacks whose own incompetence has ruined their country, One, you know, blaming, well, it's because the whites still control that bit. Yeah. And I, I fear it's just not realistic. Very, very brave, incredibly inspiring, but not realistic uh, as somewhere to say my children are going to be, my, my grandchildren are going to be safe. No, Nick, because there has already been a land claim on Orania, which, uh, very fortunately for them, the, 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 the claimants took cash rather than the land. Uh -huh. But, but, Zuma has now backdated the land grabs. So, uh -huh. whereas previously it was until oh. no, from 1913, he's now backdated it since forever. Uh -huh. So, given that, and given the fact that this latest law that they're bringing in 
means that the government can take your commercial, residential, whatever property they want. All they have to say is it's in the national interest. So they don't mm -hmm. even have to have some little yeah. goat herd come and claim yeah. your land. Yes. They just have to say it's in the national interest. And then they do not have to pay you for it because there is a the clause in there that, that makes it possible to take that land without any payment. So suddenly they could need Arania because yes. the country's starving and there's yep. food growing there. So tomorrow these people mm -hmm. in Arania could get eviction notices because it's in the national interest. Wicked. Absolutely wicked. Now those That's... laws are, are they yeah. are being signed right now. Uh -huh. Right now. Which means the government can take your intellectual property, your patents, they can take every single thing, including your bank balance, uh -huh. if it's in the national interest. And they right. don't have to prove that. The burden of that is uh -huh. not on them. So your yes. local municipality can say, I need this house and I need it mm -hmm. tomorrow. And you must go and you have to do that. So any self-determination um, or Arania style uh, thing that, that, that seems so possible and seems so worthwhile to the Africana population is already being legislated to a degree uh -huh. that it is not worthwhile. Uh -huh. And, and yes. that frightens the hell out of me because despite the fact that we think they're a bunch of clowns, they are not stupid. They close the doors before you've even got your toe in it. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? Yep. So... No, they're, they're vicious. I mean, not, not clowns at the best. They're vicious children. Yes. But with, with AK-47s. So that's, yes. not a, that's not a good mix. Yes. Um, Nick, you know, people, people tend, especially South Africans, tend to think that these people are, are stupid. Mm. But they have managed to close every single door in white South African faces in, yes. in order to stop them escaping. If you look at that South African who went to Canada and applied for refugee status, Canada gave it to him. The ANC stepped in and Canada turned that finding on its head mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. took it away from him. Now... That is a small thing in, in the big scheme of things, but it isn't. It is just proof of how far these people are prepared to go in order to keep the taxpayer base there. Because yes. the one million employed, approximately one million employed white South Africans pay between 85 and 90% of the taxes in that country. Yeah. Do you honestly think that the yeah. ANC is going to say, okay, you can now have self-determination. You can have a country of your own. Go. No, yeah. yes. they are not going to do that. They are never going to lose their only tax base. Yes, of course. So, yes, it's a grand idea. And it, 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 when you're desperate, you, you cling on to false hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes, they want to live and stay in that country. I, I understand that perfectly. But when the, the signs are all right there in your face, that you are going to be killed if you stay here, is it not then sensible to put your national pride and your stubbornness yes. on the back burner and say, look here, if I'm going to, uh, if I'm going to survive which is obviously one of our greatest instincts is survival. And if my children, grandchildren are going to survive, I have to go. Okay. Yes, indeed, indeed so, indeed so. So they and see it, that. It, it, it should be possible psychologically because the Boers, after all, part, part of the, as I understand it, the sort of the founding national myth is, is of the trek, you know, and yes. constantly you know, yes. go, 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 moving on. Uh, and away from oppression and tyranny yes. just to be yourselves. Yes. So there's there's... I would say there's two more treks for the for the Boer people. One is to 
places where they can survive, which can only either be, and survive not just as individuals, but as a, a cohesive race. group. A race. So yeah. that can only either be Central and Eastern Europe or somewhere in South America. That's the only option. There's no, no point going to the United States. It's screwed anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's as viciously anti-white as anywhere else is. Yes. Um, so one of those two places. And if they go to, especially to Eastern Europe, they will watch as the inevitable happens in Western Europe and it descends into the most appalling um, semi-Islamized bloodbath. <laughs> Just a sneeze there. Sorry about that. Please, yeah. um, but one day the peoples of... The, the refugee peoples of Western Europe, and there's already significant numbers of uh, people, not huge numbers, but significant, a significant trickle of people, either conscious nationalists or just people with, you know, their, with their, their nose sniffing the wind, but people leaving Britain, Germany, uh, Belgium and so on, and moving to places like, hung uh, like Hungary, uh, Slovenia. It's already happening. There's going to be a torrent of refugees in due course from Western Europe to those places. And one day, I don't know how long, it might be our grandchildren's time, there will then be a further trek, and as I said earlier on, a reconquista of an liberation yes. of Western Europe, and the place will be in ruins, and the, the greatest cathedrals and monuments will be rebuilt, and the rest <laughs> will all have, to, all have to be afresh. And one of the countries that's going to be most devastated uh, is uh, Holland and Flanders, the very place the Boers originally came from, mm. and if if they trek and thereby survive, one day they can trek on and go back to the country they very first began in, and they fled there, many of them for persecution and so on, yes. uh, and those lands had to be taken back because it's unthinkable that the, the very heartland of Western civilization, places like France and Holland and England, it's unthinkable that they can remain in the hands of incompetent barbarians forever. I mean, two or three generations of breeding with their first cousins and insisting that their women be dressed in black sacks ah. in, a, in, in a part of the world where there's virtually no vitamin um, uh, e, D to be manufactured by the sun in dark skin anyway, um, those people will lose control of Western Europe just as the, the Ottoman Turks lost control before of, of the centre and the east. They will be thrown out and our people will rise again. But it won't be in our lifetime. No. But if people want the vision as to why are we moving, let that be the vision. You're moving so that your children and grandchildren survive and so that their grandchildren can take back the original homeland. Wow. I'm, there you go. I'm going to There's a vision for you. I'm stealing that, that great Trek story from you. I de definitely am. You will hear it many, many times. And I'm afraid sometimes I won't attributed to its author but but yeah, uh, that, that doesn't that doesn't matter it's the it's the meme it's the concept we have to get out there uh, because our, the history is made not by blind economic forces or any such marxist nonsense history is made by great individuals and by great ideas i love that idea because it is so central to who a boy is you well, know there's no yeah, question about that theory. Uh, it's the, that's, that, that's, I, I thought it might be, but it's the first time I've tried it out on someone who understands them. No, it so, is, it is central to who they are because they have always said, OK, I don't like what's happening here. I'm going to go and find my own place where I can make it happen the way I wanted to. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a perfect analogy. I love it. Now, they have proven that they can do this because many, many Boers went to Georgia Yes, and yeah, they that, are that's farming that I know. successfully yes. there. Yes, and the the Boers that went to Argentina at the end of the Boer War, a whole bunch of Boers went to Argentina, and it is only in the last say twenty years that Afrikaans is dying out in Argentina. And, and, and that's almost certainly, I, I guess, because of the television yes. more than anything else. Um, yes, I'm aware. Instantly, obviously, I, I'm speaking to you from Wales. Mm. Uh, I. My own Welsh is very, very limited, but lots of my family were Welsh centuries past. My four kids grew up going to a Welsh school and absolutely uh, bilingual Welsh and English. And in the Falklands War, little known piece of history for you here, um, it's the only war in history where there, were, apart, uh, where there were Welsh speakers on both sides. Because some of the Argentines' co constructs spoke Welsh. Mm. Because in about 1890, a group of uh, committed Welsh nationalists, despairing of ever being treated fairly by the English and having their own tongue allowed in their own country, up sticks and move to Argentina, 
uh, just a little bit before the Boers, uh, and established uh, Welsh colonies in Patagonia, which are still there, still with Welsh surnames, still speaking a slightly archaic form of Welsh, as well as Spanish, uh, and they still have that identity, and there's still connections easier in these days of jet flight. Uh, there's still connections between uh, Welsh Wales and the um, Welsh-speaking uh, communities in Patagonia, Argentina, although, of course, they too are losing um, you know, losing the language bit by bit, just as the Boers have, mm. because of the, the sheer pressure of um, you know, education systems and television on a small population. But it does show that they've been there for well over 100 years, uh, and they're fiercely Welsh, but um, completely loyal to the Argentinian state, which is how it should be. So the Boers have already proven in those two cases, and very, very, very centuries apart cases, they've proven that they can do this. So there is no reason why they shouldn't do it again Indeed. and have their own place, their own language, their own education system, their own <coughs> church. So, uh, Nick, we have about 10 minutes less left. If you would like to just tell us what you've done so far and what you think the future will be. Or can you? Yes. Well, it, with with regard specifically to this this subject, yes, of the Boers, yes. yes. Well, I've been uh, spent a number of uh, visits to to Hungary, uh, and I've just come back from Belarus, uh, which is uh, a, a, a state which, because it works very well, uh, and has a a post communist it's a post communist society. It was part of the Soviet Union. Uh, it basically uh, lies south of the Baltic states, Lithuania and Latvia, and so on. Uh, east of Poland, west of Russia, and north of Ukraine. It's 10 million people. It's a, a, a big state, extraordinarily well run, clean, happy, and prosperous by uh, East European standards. Its economy has done better by far than Ukraine, and even better than Russia's as well, out of the, the former Soviet but Russian countries, uh, because it's run basically as a nationalist state uh, by a nationalist government, which refuses to go in for head counting the uh, the uh, the president has said that he makes the rules and it works well. And it works better than 300 idiots pressing a button, which having been one of the idiots pressing a button in the <laughs> European Parliament, sums it up absolutely perfectly. Uh, so it's a well-run state uh, that didn't go in for the Russian uh, mass privatisation, i.e. looting by oligarchs and foreign corporations. Still has a steel industry, for example, heavy industry. But on the back of that, it's building a very, very advanced high-tech industry. Viber, for instance, is based there, that a lot of your viewers will know of. Yes. Um, so it's a very successful state, uh, but it's got a problem with people leaving the land. Uh, the land is still owned by the state, but they're considering experimenting with family farms because as they're nationalists rather than communists, mm. they uh, and Christians rather than Marxists, they understand that the institution of private property, well-regulated, so it doesn't become a free-for-all, uh, where it, most private property is swallowed up by a few on the you know, the American model, uh, they understand that it's a fundamental to human dignity and to a well-ordered society. So they're looking to experiment in that. Uh, and I've had meetings with some very, very influential think tanks over there and discussed the Boers, uh, and they've said, well, yes, put together a, a simple explanatory sort of package and so on, and we'll see what we can do, because they have a demographic problem of their own. Mm. They, have spare, they have spare space. As I said, they have a tr tradition of accepting European refugees and integrating them well. Uh, and so they are, they're genuinely interested. I don't, want people to, I don't want to get people's hopes up. They have not said yes. They have said, we're genuinely interested. We'll look at this further. They were very concerned. They said, well, you know, could these people even adapt to our, you know, to our climate? Because summers there are, are, are very hot. Uh, but you know, winters are pretty vicious. Uh, so I said, well, the, the Boers have adapted on, on the high veld. It snows in the winter, and they've adapted to the most appalling, basically, desert conditions and made them bloom. You know, they can make things grow. Uh, and even a Soviet-style collective farming system, one of the most inefficient forms of agriculture known to man, nevertheless always made uh, Belarus an, an, you know, a big exporter of grain. Because the soil there, it goes, it rolls on and on forever, as far as the eye can see. You know, good, rich, deep, dark soil. Not as good as Ukraine, but still very, very good. So they're seriously interested. In um, in Hungary, there's even this enthusiastic support for the ideas 
idea of Bloor's going there. Hung Hunger is part Calvinist. The Calvinists, of course, think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, but even the Catholics, again, recognising that Hungary has a demographic problem. Basically, the people breeding fastest there are Roma gypsies, who are Asiatic and in, in, innate, inordinate thieves. Mm. Uh, so they, they recognise that, and they, can, they see the Boers would be uh, a, a huge benefit to their society. The Hungarians, more than others, huge parts of Hungary were so devastated by the, um, the Mongol and then later by the, the Turkish Ottoman invasions Vast areas were laid waste. Every man, woman, child and farm animal was, was butchered. Uh, and at the end of all that, they, they, they invited the Germans and various people uh, from uh, further west to go in and settle vast tracts. Uh, and they, in due course, became Hungarians, although still keeping parts of their old traditions. So they look at the Boers as, uh, at, with immediate understanding and enthusiasm. Uh, and Orban's government, it's... The mo probably the most remarkable government in Central Europe. It was the first to put up a uh, you know, a wall against the uh, the Muslim refugee invasion. Yes. Um, press primarily they ne wouldn't necessarily done it by themselves, but uh, they've got a, a seriously uh, large and popular radical nationalist opposition in the Jobbik party, uh, which was making noises in that direction. So they felt they had to, they had to do something, and they've done it very effectively. Orban and his key advisers have laid it on the line. They said that. What's going on is an attack on European civilization. Uh, we had to stand up against it, not just for Hungary, but on behalf of the whole of Europe. So they're, they're taking a leading role. Uh, and again, they haven't said yes. The key, key members of the opposition party have said yes, absolutely, and are sort of helping on this project. But we have to sell it to the government. So we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, and then, of course, there's Russia, uh, and we're putting together a... Uh, uh, an advertising, in effect, explanatory video and short package, which I know for sure we can get well up the ladder of the Russian government. I don't have a hotline to President Putin, unfortunately. Um, uh, but we can get it well up the ladder of the Russian government. Again, they too know that their defence minister recently said that um, Russia actually needs 600 million people to properly defend the, and to hold the, land of, the lands of Russia. Uh, and they've got 190 uh, so uh, they, they're well aware that they need more people. They, too, have a history of taking peoples. And I, I've said that we can point out that if they took people from almost anywhere else on the planet, they're bringing in people who have a dual loyalty. If they took hundreds of thousands of, of Brits, uh, are they ending up with people who become loyal Russians while keeping an identity of their own? Or are they getting a British fifth column? They wouldn't know. But in the case of the Boers, they're getting people who have no state. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, who've been their 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 ancestral lands in Holland are so disgustingly despicable, liberal, anti-white racists. You know, they absolutely they absolutely hate them, uh, and South Africa, South Africa obviously has no time for them. So there they have a, a people who I'm sure would be not just would seize the opportunity of good land and the opportunity to work it uh, and raise families there, but I'm sure would be innately and intensely loyal to the state which has given them that chance uh, without any possibility of dual loyalties. So I'm involved, I'm not the only one, there's other people doing this as well, but so the sort of great minds think you like to an extent, and we are all in touch, pretty much in touch, uh, working as best we can to, to open these doors. Uh, I, I pray to God that we open the doors before it's too late for some yeah. so that you know, people can get there um, safely. I think that... If it really came down to you know, genocidal level, then where the Boers can, can hold on and survive, then under those circumstances, I think it will be possible to open the doors. Uh, but hope, there's a good chance that we can open it before it gets to that stage. And if we can do it just with a few families, uh, and we can, you know, we, we're probably going to need help with people from the USA fundraising and all the rest of it. If we can do it with a few families people who've just become unemployed so that they've still got that work ethic yes, and so on, yes. rather than people who've been on the scrap heap for so long that inevitably they've forgotten it. If we can do it with some of the first really good people and establish the base and make it work, then as the pressure gets worse and the dangers are, danger arise, then I think that even if we do it in one state, there'll then be other states watching it and understanding, well, this is good for us. It's good for from a humanitarian point of view. It allows us to deal with the sneers and 
jibes of Western Europe that we're not taking our share of refugees. Yes. You know, because everyone knows that the so-called Syrian refugees pouring into Germany are neither Syrian nor refugees. And the ones who are Syrian, in fact, are refugees because they're people who refuse to accept living in a secular tolerant state because they want a Wahhabi dictatorship. Um, so it has all sorts of possibilities for the for the governments of Central and West and Eastern Europe to say, we'll take these people because it's good all round. And all we can do is try, but we are trying very hard. Thank you, Nick. You have a long, hard road ahead, but we will definitely have you back for updates. And thank you so much for taking the cause of our poor people who cannot fight for themselves. I mean, that they are outnumbered. Uh, mm. by the masses. They are disenfranchised. They are dispossessed. They, they have no arms and ammunition. They cannot mm. do anything for themselves. So thank you very much for standing up for these people who need somebody like you who is willing and able to make a difference. And we will definitely have you back, Nick, to give us an update on this. Okay. And good, good. luck. Well, thank, thank you to you for giving me the, you know, the platform to talk about it and many other things. It's been an enjoyable session. I hope that you get a good um, uh, feedback from your many listeners. Um, you know, and a, a best wishes and goodwill to all of you listening. And I do hope to be back uh, in the not too distant future and carry on the conversation and hopefully between us carry on the good work. Thank you so much, Nick, and good night.